I'm absolutely delighted to be back in India. I was first here in 2016, but not to Mumbai. I was in the more characteristic pattern of Delhi and Jaipur, Varanasi, Agra, and I was itching to come back to India and particularly to be in Mumbai. And I'm very grateful to the Dadaboy family uh, for welcoming me into their wedding plans for their son, uh, Hormuz, and uh, his new bride, uh, Susan Anderson, whose parents are treasured friends of mine in Toronto. And I'm also very grateful to the uh, Melimeta Music Foundation and to Meru and uh, to uh, Feroza and the Asia Society uh, and the Riker Godraj Family Foundation. And it, it is, I think, fitting that we're having this talk in a building where Meli Mehta did conduct the Bombay Symphony Orchestra, and even in a building where the great Paul Robeson sang when he was in India. And I have other Robeson stories I can tell you, but I'll hold off on those. Now, because I was introduced as an academic, I have to give my disclosures as an academic. That's something we all do at the beginning. But I'm going to give you disclosures and disclaimers. A disclosure, to differentiate the two, a disclosure is about your conflict of interest. Well, I have no conflicts of interest in relation to tonight's talk. But I do have disclaimers. And a disclaimer is the reason why you shouldn't even listen to the speaker in the first place. And my disclaimers are that, number one, I'm not a researcher in creativity, but I have been talking about and studying this subject for about 20 years and speaking to audiences of psychiatrists and theater goers and musicians across the country. I should add, I do play the piano regularly for the last 65 years, but uh, my teachers and music critics across the country were unanimous in their view that I should apply to medical school. <laughs> now, let me start with what I hope is a familiar image and sound for you. You were about to hear uh, the uh, opening bars of the 1955 recording of the Goldberg variations of Johann Sebastian Bach. Probably the single most famous piano recording of the 20th century. Certainly one of the best-selling recordings of the 20th century in classical music. And the performer here is the young Glenn Gould, Canada's gift to music in the 20th century. In the 21st century, I think it's Justin Bieber. But uh, in the 20th century, it was Glenn Gould. And he was a creative genius of the keyboard. And he has been the subject of endless neurological and psychiatric speculation, a type of autopsy, because he's dead now, that risks sapping the pleasure out of listening to his music. And I'm going to come back to the subject of Glenn Gould as we often do in listening to his performances. But if the slide projector is, with any luck, working, I'm going to show you uh, a very different image. And some of you may recognize this rather unhappy-looking man in this photograph. This is Robert Schumann, the composer. And one of the great biographies of Robert Schumann was written by a man who wrote a biography of Glenn Gould as well, Peter Ostwald, who is a psychiatrist. And he was also a chamber musician who actually played chamber music with Glenn Gould. But he wrote a biography of Robert Schumann and his extraordinary struggle with mental illness. Because Robert Schumann, like so many members of his family, had bipolar disorder, what we used to call manic depressive illness. And he made multiple suicide attempts and ultimately died living in an asylum in the final years of his life. And uh, we actually have autopsy evidence that tells us he didn't have syphilis, which is what put so many people in institutions, but he actually did 
have bipolar disorder. And uh, if you see a modern film about the life of Robert Schumann, a wonderful German film called Geliebte Clara, about his wife Clara Schumann and her relationship with Schumann and with Johannes Brahms, it's a very unromantic portrait of the reality of mental illness and its impact in his life. But I want to get into the subject at hand, which involves defining some terms. This is, by the way, a picture of what Canada looks like right now. <laughs> uh, let me start with a, a definition of the brain. And the brain is a chemical soup, uh, to put it bluntly. It's a highly elaborated and evolved neural network of interacting neurons. And what that means is uh, signals that are happening among 100 billion neurons in your head that have 100 trillion connections between them. So if you think about that for a moment, you understand why somebody once said, if the brain was so simple that we could understand it, we would be so simple that we couldn't. Because it is the final frontier in our understanding of the human body. It's our single most complex organ. Apart from the brain, we have the mind. And what is the mind? Well, that's an ineffable, unknowable essence that defines our consciousness and who we are, but it completely defies localization in the anatomy of the brain. We can't tell you where in that chemical soup the mind sits. And then there's the problem of defining creativity. How are we going to define it? And you know, I, I had the privilege of seeing the textile exhibit uh, in this very building which is the embodiment of creativity. Uh, but if you had to put your finger on how you define creativity, we're not so sure, right? It becomes a little like pornography. You know it when you see it, but uh, how you actually define it can become a bit of a challenge. But we recognize it in our children's paintings or in listening to inspiring music or seeing great stage performances. And the uh, playwright Henrik Ibsen tried to define creativity as the spark of the divine fire. Very poetic image. How do you measure that, right? How do you operationalize that? Well, this is where uh, three women in the late 20th century did the pioneering research in understanding creativity. And I'm very much aware of and appreciative of the fact that there are three uh, smart women in this audience, Meher, Meru, and Feroza, who uh, contributed to my being here. And I owe this talk to the three women who did the hard work uh, in uh, advancing understanding. And the first one was a psychiatrist named Nancy Andreessen. And she said that creativity involves the capacity to see something new that other people could not see. And she said it has three components to it. Number one, originality. It can't be something that's happened exactly that same way before. Number two, it has to be useful in some way. And that doesn't mean it has to be practical, but it has to do something even in the order of inspiring awe. It has to trigger a reaction. Uh, it has to have a product. You can't simply say, I'm feeling creative or I'm being creative without anything to show for it. So it begins with a person who uses a creative cognitive process to produce a product. And Thomas Edison described it very simply, and he was one of the most creative people of his time. He said it was 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And it involves the capacity to think along different channels, what we call divergent thinking and it involves cognitive flexibility, that ability 
to break with conventional patterns or obvious patterns of thinking. And interestingly, we find some of those same qualities in people with mental illness, which involves thinking differently than conventional patterns of thinking. And so there are a variety of scientific measures that now exist, and it's sort of hard to, to fathom this, but we actually have metrics around creativity. Now the problem with those metrics is that uh, their scientific reliability is reflected by the fact that two independent raters will give the same numerical value of uh, a score of creativity. That doesn't bring us closer to the essence of what it is. Albert Einstein famously said that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So when in doubt as humans, we tend to classify things. It's our first response to the unknown, whether it's in religion or science or philosophy, we are relentless classifiers. I think it's a pretty fundamental human drive toward taxonomy, classification, hierarchy, this is more important than that, and uh, territory, this is mine and that's yours. So what is needed to be creative? Well, broadly defined, it's intelligence, but it's important to note that many intelligent people are not particularly creative, and not all creative people are necessarily intelligent. But intelligence is one of the components. Another one is imagination, not surprisingly. A third is drive, because it doesn't come as a eureka phenomenon, uh, the romantic notion of discovery is eureka, right? I've suddenly realized. And Isaac Asimov famously wrote that science doesn't come from eureka moments. It comes from someone saying, that's funny. And starting after noticing something unusual to follow a line of pursuit. It requires a certain degree of solitude and for many people, it requires an incentive. That was sometimes financial for Beethoven, for Ernest Hemingway. Financial imperatives drove creativity. There's a famous uh, musical that's on Broadway now by Stephen Sondheim called Merrily We Roll Along. And it's about a composer and a lyricist and their collaboration over many years. And they're asked together in an interview that classic question, what comes first when you're writing a song? The lyrics or the music? And they answer in unison, the contract. <laughs> <laughs> because that can be one of the drivers of the creative process. So let me, as the former chair of the Stratford Shakespeare Festival, share with you the words of one of the most prolific, successful, and memorable playwrights of all times, whose works have appeared around the world, including in Hindi. And I'm speaking, of course, of Neil Simon. Now, this face may not be that familiar to you. In case you didn't recognize him right away, you may have seen a couple of months ago at the Prithvi uh, Festival, the play Purane Chawal. Did anybody see it here? I guess it was a big hit. Uh, <laughs> and it was translated into Hindi by Farooq Sayer, and it got rave reviews in the newspaper because I, I went on to the Mumbai newspapers to see how the play landed, and people thought it was very funny. And in English, the play is called The Sunshine Boys. And it's about two very old Jewish comedians who have a reunion in New York. Now, the reason I put up Neil Simon's face is because he had the misfortune of taking an airplane ride and the passenger seated next to him was Nancy Andreessen, a creativity researcher. 
So she used the several hours next to him to interview him. He probably wanted to read a magazine, but uh, she grilled him about his creative process. And so let me distill for you what it was he said about how he creates. The first thing he said is, I slip into a state that is apart from reality. So in that moment, he has the capacity to focus intensely, to dissociate and disconnect from his immediate environment and reach a kind of remote and transcendent place where he can create. He said, I don't write consciously. It's as if the muse sits on my shoulder. In other words, that the process of creating can't simply be consciously willed into existence. He said that he never knew how his plays were going to end until he started writing them. And he wrote 32 of them, almost as many as Shakespeare. He said that my mind tends to wander, even when I'm talking. And that uh, speaks to a, an alternative filtering mechanism that creative people have that leads to heightened perceptions, a greater sensitivity to stimuli that the rest of us don't even notice and it increases the intensity of experience. And this has been very much validated in the scientific literature. He said that when he's with other people, he almost feels invisible. And that allows him to stand back and observe human interaction in a way that he can then fold into his plays. Now, to shift gears from Neil Simon and come back a little bit to Glenn Gould, I want to talk about a composer who Glenn Gould felt did not die too young, but rather lived too long. And Glenn Gould recorded his music, and it's, it's quite terrible to listen to. I'm speaking about uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And Gould felt that his final years of composition were not great. And it's a shame that he didn't die much younger than his already young death. But we have a letter that was apparently written by Mozart, uh, published in 1815, about how he created. And these are Mozart's words. When, I'm a, when I am alone, as it were, completely in myself and of good cheer, say, traveling in a carriage or walking after a good meal or during the night when I cannot sleep, it's on such occasions that my ideas flow best and abundantly. Whence and how they come, I know not, nor can I force them. All this fires my soul, and provided I'm not disturbed, my subject enlarges itself, becomes methodized and defined, and in the whole, though it be long, stands almost complete and finished in my mind, so that I can survey it, like a fine picture or a beautiful statue at a glance. Nor do I hear in my imagination the parts successively, but I hear them as it were all at once. What a delight this is, I cannot tell. All this inventing, this producing, takes place in a pleasing, lively dream. What has thus been produced I do not easily forget, and this is perhaps my best gift that I have to thank my maker for. I may take out of the bag of my memory, if I may use that phrase, what has been previously collected into it in the way that I have mentioned. For this reason, the committing to paper is quickly done. For everything is, as I've said before, already finished, and it rarely differs on paper from what it was in my imagination. So you can understand why the composer Salieri and all of his other working stiffs in music found Mozart so annoying. Uh, and it may be of some comfort to you to know that this letter from Mozart is actually now considered a forgery, so that his creative process remains uh, a mystery to us. So if we flash forward to the 20th century, uh, the last composer that I'll talk about is Richard Rogers, who had only three creative partners 
in his long career. Lawrence Hart, perhaps most famously uh, Oscar Hammerstein II of the Rogers and Hammerstein pair, and then uh, sadly uh, with Stephen Sondheim, a very unhappy collaboration. Now, I would say that Richard Rogers was not as poetic as Mozart uh, in a description of his creative process. He was interviewed about it, and he said simply, I can pee melody. <laughs> All right? It's, uh, and he had a, a very long and steady stream for uh, <laughs> about 70 years. Uh, and I understand that his musical, The Sound of Music, had its stage debut here last year at the Nita Mukesh Ambani Cultural Center. I hope people got to enjoy it. One of the big questions, about, I'll get you off the mind of his stream there. Uh, one of the big questions in research on creativity and mental health is whether creative people are moody by nature. And there are famous people who've commented on this. Lord Byron, for one, said, we of the craft are all crazy. Some are touched by gaiety, others by melancholy, but we are all touched. And of course, in turn, Lord Byron touched a lot of people himself. Now, there's a long list of composers who have struggled with mental illness. Berlioz, Bruckner, Elgar, Handel, Ives, Mahler, Mussorgsky, Rachmaninoff, who dedicated his second piano concerto to the hypnotherapist, Dr. Dahl, who brought him, not, not your Dahl, it's uh, D-A-H-L, less tasty. And uh, uh, Dr. Dahl had Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto, his most famous work, dedicated to him for bringing him out of a depression. Rossini, Schumann, as I mentioned, Scriabin and Wolf, many, many more. But we can go back all the way to Aristotle, who said that those who have become eminent in philosophy, politics, poetry, and the arts have all had tendencies toward melancholia. And of course, Shakespeare himself said that the lunatic, the lover, and the poet are of imagination all compact. But from Hellenic to pandemic times, the debate and the study continues. Recent very systematic research supports the rates of mood disorders being elevated among artists, but also being elevated among their family members. And it's the study of families of creative people that's actually the most interesting to me because when you look at the relatives of creative people, they have higher rates of both creativity and of mental illness. Now, an important question and perhaps the most important question that you're going to leave here with because a lot of this material is being forgotten as I'm saying it is does moodiness help the creative process? And this really appeals to our romantic notions of the mad genius in a garret apartment locked up for days and weeks composing great poems or operas or writing great novels. And this has been a typical theme in Hollywood films Maybe in Bollywood films, I don't know, but certainly in Hollywood films. And the evidence is that is completely not the case. If anything, having a mood disorder diminishes creativity. Let me give you some examples. The great writer Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels, spent a year in a severe depression without reading or speaking to anyone. Samuel Johnson said, a kind of strange oblivion settled over me. Rossini, the opera composer, became so ill, he believed he was penniless and unable to compose. Keats said, I'm now so depressed, I do not have an idea to put to paper. But if we hurtle forward to the late 20th century, 
the first systematic study was done in Iowa of creative writers. And there were 30 of them gathered for the Iowa Writers Workshop in the United States. Highly competitive to get into this program uh, for creative writing. And so Nancy Andreasen studied them and their relatives. And importantly for science, she had a control group. People matched for age, but who did not have uh, any creative potential that was being uh, uh, exploited in any way. And what she discovered was that the rates of mood disorders, depression, manic depressive illness, were higher, much higher, in the writers and in the writers' families than in the healthy controls or the relatives of the healthy controls. And further, she wrote that all the writers were not depressed at the time she interviewed them. So they were able to look back on their own experiences of depression or mania with considerable detachment. And consistently, they said they were not able to be creative as writers when they were ill. So the theme, once again, is that when it comes to creativity, illness does not help. So we've got a connection between illness and creativity, but what is the nature of that connection? And here we turn to one of the, se the, the second great researcher in this area, uh, Ruth Richards, also from the United States, who did research to show that the degree of impairment that you have, if you have a mental illness, is part of the connection between mood disorders and creativity. So for example, people who have an attenuated or mild form of bipolar disorder, something we call cyclothymia, they have higher creativity scores than people who have full-blown bipolar disorder or manic depressive illness. And this generated what's called the inverted U hypothesis. Now brace yourself. This slide uh, is a graph. It's a very scientifically complex graph. There you go. I hope you're going to be able to follow this complicated graph. And on the horizontal axis, as it moves from left to right, you're getting more and more ill. You're more symptomatic with your illness. And on the vertical axis is creativity. So what you see is that with mild symptomatology, creativity actually is in the ascendant. But then as you become more pronounced in your illness, creativity drops down. And uh, this is a uh, very validated graph now by extensive research. So the problem is nobody can put the brakes on illness when you're at the top of the upside down U. In other words, people who develop mental illnesses, the challenge is it becomes a runaway train. And so you can't just it's like you can't be a little bit pregnant. You also can't be a little bit uh, mentally ill. It tends to evolve. Now, the second question I want to pose to you is what does the study of families tell us? And I'm very conscious of being in a country of 1.2 billion people where you have access to huge numbers, but you may not be as tightly regulated as a nation as Sweden is. And even though Sweden is much smaller, they're able to do research in Sweden where they can collect, for instance, for study, 50,000 people with schizophrenia, 30,000 people with bipolar disorder, 217,000 people with depression, and all of their first, second, and third degree relatives, right? And get the data on all of these people. And that data includes their occupations, their IQ scores, all of this information is available in a national data system. 
And again, what they found reinforces what I said earlier, that bipolar disorder is significantly overrepresented in creative professions compared to healthy controls, mainly in the arts, but that the first degree relatives, right, the siblings, the parents, the aunts, the uncles, are more likely to be in creative professions than the relatives of healthy controls. And the findings were quite specific for bipolar disorder, for manic depressive illness. And the thinking is that the genetic susceptibility that we have to illnesses like bipolar disorder may be linked to adaptive advantages like creativity. And that may be one of the expl uh, explanations as to why these illnesses persist, they don't die out, even though people with mental illnesses are much less likely to reproduce. They're much less likely to have children, and yet these illnesses uh, persist. The third question is, what is the biology of creativity? Well, as in the film uh, The Graduate, which older members of this audience may remember, the word is plastics. And by that I mean the plasticity of the human brain. Right? It's a highly plastic changing organism. It's not a static one. And it changes our brains in response to both genes and the environment. I wanted to remind you of the world before Uber and Waze and Google Maps. If you were ever in England and you hailed a black cab, the British cab drivers knew the grid of Greater London in ways that nobody else did. And they did brain imaging studies of British cab drivers compared to healthy controls and they found that there was an increase in the area of the brain where memory is stored that correlated with how many years these people had been driving cabs in London. Now, we've, with Waze and Uber, we've all had brain shrinkage in that area because we, we don't know how to read maps anymore and we don't know where anything is. Similarly, studies, brain imaging studies of symphony musicians have shown uh, particular changes in areas that are associated with the creation of music and the reading of music, both the visuospatial areas of the brain and even the motor coordination areas of the brain. Um, I'm going to skip ahead just in the interest of time. You know, uh, uh, a few minutes ago I noticed my friend Jamie Anderson was checking his watch and then just now I saw him checking his calendar. So uh, perhaps I, I should move along a little bit in my talk, uh, which is why on earth would creativity have something in common with disturbances of the mind as in mental illness? And this brings us to our third great uh, researcher, Shelley Carson. And she wrote that factors that are common to creativity and psychopathology allow us to do something special. To increase access and attention to material that's being processed below the level of conscious awareness, while at the same time we've got a kind of protection going on in our brain that allows us to stay in control of what's happening, not simply surrender to subconscious processes. And the analogy she gave was the skin diver. And imagine that the skin diver is exploring the underwater world of the subconscious, but with a, a breathing tube that's connecting him to the surface. And so uh, it's maintaining that connection. And she talked about a shared vulnerability between mental illness and creativity comprising three components. What are those three components? First, you need to understand a concept, and I hope this isn't too technical, called latent 
inhibition. Latent inhibition is something that everyone in this audience is using right now. And if you're not using it, please raise your hand. Uh, what latent inhibition is, is the ability to screen out from consciousness things that you deem irrelevant, such as, you know, a speaker at a podium, for instance. Uh, you may be thinking about something else entirely, and you've just got a little vague background noise of somebody at a microphone because you're preoccupied with something else. And uh, that's, we spend most of our days, if you're walking on streets in Mumbai, you are screening out a lot of stimuli of all your senses in order to focus on what is important to you. People who are creative are much more attuned to those stimuli that you're screening out. So in other words, they have a reduction in latent inhibition. And so do people with mental illness. So that somebody, for instance, who is paranoid notices minor details like that bouquet of flowers sitting on that table and has a th series of thoughts about why is that there, who put it there, what purpose does it have, is it directed or connected in some way toward me? And that's a horrible and disturbing line of thinking that distracts that person because they have reduced latent inhibition. I'm not thinking about those flowers. I have screened them out. And this is actually associated with an increase in a particular brain chemical called dopamine. Beyond the reduction in latent inhibition is something called novelty seeking. I happen to be somebody who scores very high on novelty seeking in that I'm always curious about what's around the corner. And uh, if it's something I haven't done before, I, I put my hand up to do it because I want a new experience. Creative people tend to seek out novel or complex stimuli, and it, they find it enhances their curiosity, their motivation. It's also rewarded in the brain by dopamine. You get a hit from it. And this is also found in people with mania and with substance abuse. The third and final factor is something called hyperconnectivity. And what that is, and it's something we can measure, is unusual connections between different regions of the brain that are not usually in touch with each other. And that hyperconnectivity is reported in mania, depression, uh, these are the, uh, uh, intoxication, and also it's reported in highly creative people. It's recorded, uh, reported in people who experience something called synesthesia, which means they can smell musical notes, for instance, right? That it has a, a note has a particular smell. So it's a crossing of the senses. And this is uh, a, a validated finding both in mental illness and in creativity. Now, creativity doesn't occur in a vacuum. As I mentioned at the beginning, there's often an incentive. Uh, and I talked about positive incentives like money. Uh, but there are also negative incentives like adversity. And there are many examples of this. Don Quixote, uh, the first modern novel, was written while Cervantes was in jail. Beethoven wrote symphonies in the wake of disillusionment with Napoleon. Picasso created his famous painting Guernica in the wake of a bombing. But those external adversities are not to be confused with mental illnesses that can strike in the absence of external threat and truly paralyze the individual. If you think about an illness like depression, and depression is common in India, in everywhere in the world, right? One in five women, one in 10 men over the course of their lives struggle with depression. 
Depression is not merely a situation of feeling sad, right? Even though if we want to sound sophisticated, we use the word depressed when we mean sad. You know, I'm, I'm so depressed about the outcome of the recent cricket match, South Africa, and yada, yada, right? You're, you're annoyed, you're disappointed, you're not depressed, right? Uh, when depression as an illness hits, it simply it does more than lower your mood. It reliably disrupts your ability to concentrate, to make decisions, to feel motivated, to pay attention, to experience pleasure, and to experience hope. And all of those, I would argue, are essential components of a creative process. I'm going to quote a fourth woman as I conclude. That fourth woman is Kay Redfield Jameson, uh, who has written beautifully about the creative process. She's a distinguished professor at Johns Hopkins University in the United States. She's a world authority on bipolar disorder, and she happens to have bipolar disorder. And she wrote a book about it called An Unquiet Mind, about her own experience of bipolar disorder. And Kay and I were on a panel together about a decade ago at the Art Gallery of Ontario on creativity. And she made uh, a really important point. She said, look, most people who are creative do not have a mental illness, and most people who have a mental illness are not particularly creative. So I want to conclude by saying that we should not trivialize ever the impact of mental illness on the person, the family, the society, and the culture and acknowledge that we are much better at battling mental illness than we are at bottling creativity. And that very often, treating mental illness allows creativity to come out of the bottle. So on that note, I will uh, conclude, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. I realize I'm the final frontier between you and dinner, so. <laughs> There's some questions at the back. Uh, fascinating, insightful talk, sir. My question is, can you identify people who will develop mental, mental illness later on in life, like you have in other diseases like cancer? And the second question is, they say that creativity is on the right lobe of the brain. So by studying that, do we get any more insights if that is correct? Thank you. Thank you. I, I wish, uh, you know, one of the holy grails is prevention uh, and prediction, right? To know uh, when someone is going to, later in life, develop mental illnesses. Because typically mental illnesses have their onset, their first episodes in uh, early adolescence, and young adulthood. That's when 75% of mental illnesses first appear. Unfortunately, at this juncture, we have no way of reliably predicting. And I want to emphasize the importance of the word reliably. Because when it comes to most cancers, we can't reliably predict in advance when that tragedy is going to strike someone. And in fact, in the case of cancer, it can be delays of 50, 60, 70 years before a cancer may emerge. Uh, it's much shorter, the timeline to developing a mental illness, but at this juncture, we cannot say. We, are, we know there are things that put people at risk for having a mental illness, but it's important to acknowledge that risk is not destiny. We're all at risk for a variety of things. It doesn't mean they're going to happen. If, for instance, 
let's take the condition of alcoholism, which is one of the most highly heritable medical conditions in the world. If you come from a family of uh, all the males having heart attacks by age 30, right, you are going to raise your child to have a very healthy diet and heart smart and take a lot of steps. What are you going to do if your father, your grandfather, and five of your uncles all had alcoholism? Are you going to speak to your child about the importance of never taking a drink? Because they are at genetically very high risk. And the answer is often no because of the stigma and shame of having alcoholism in a family. And the more people speak openly and acknowledge the reality of one of the most common forms of human suffering in the world, mental illness, uh, the more people will take appropriate steps. You know, in Canada, for instance, we have uh, full access to cannabis, to marijuana, right? There are no barriers, no legal restrictions. It's sold everywhere. And for most people, it's a benign drug. However, if you have a relative with schizophrenia, you should not smoke cannabis because the likelihood of that triggering an episode of psychosis in you is very high. But if you're a family that doesn't acknowledge that an uncle spent 20 years in a psychiatric institution with schizophrenia and it's never mentioned in the home, that's a problem because that child grows up without knowing his or her risks and learning to manage them. So I don't think it's so much about prediction with certainty, but it is about management of risk. Yes. Uh, my name is Freddy. I work with students in the area of uh, suicide prevention. Ah. So uh, there's a lot of uh, name throwing that goes on among students. How would you as an expert differentiate between mental illness, sickness, disease and disorder? So for, I don't know if people heard, did people hear the question? Okay, uh, so this gentleman works with youth in suicide prevention and uh, here's a lot of, I think, casual language, right? And uh, I go back to the example about being depressed about the outcome of a cricket match. Uh, as, a, um, as a dilution of the significance and impact of what real mental illness is. I hear people say, oh, I'm so OCD. I, you know, I tend to organize my shirts uh, in the same colors. Well, that's a profound disservice to the people who actually suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. Or people who say, you know, I." Uh, this dress is tight. I wish I had anorexia nervosa for a week. Well, if you develop anorexia nervosa, number one, your likelihood of dying of that illness is significant and its erosive effect on your functioning and your quality of life are profound. So I think in the case of young people where language is often loosely tossed. I mean, the positive aspect is that they are to, they, young people do talk much more openly about mental illness than their parents do. And so that's a positive step forward. But they use language very loosely. So I think that there is, beyond suicide prevention, there's a really important role for education about what mental illness is and what it is not. And I, I've actually given that talk called Mental Illness, What It Is and What It Isn't, because people have so many misconceptions uh, about what it is that you've got to uh, partner the work you're doing in suicide prevention with education about what mental illness truly is. And that's a, a whole separate talk. But since you're all seated and you've got a couple of hours, <laughs> no, I, I won't go into it. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Dr. Rucha. Uh, 
Yeah. I'm Dr. Rucha. I'm a researcher myself. And it's very interesting to see the association between the psychopathology of mental illness with creativity. But uh, I'm a community medicine doctor, so I would like to ask ki how uh, can you implement the results of these research work into the community to improve, to reduce the problem of mental illness in the society? Okay, so that's a big question about how <laughs> I, I would uh, recommend it. You know, one, uh, we were having a discussion earlier about the impact of COVID with one of the members of the audience and uh, you know COVID led some people into more creative pursuits because they suddenly found they had time on their hands um, and there is a lot of research that has been done on engaging people with creative tasks in groups. It's not so much that there's massive creative output but people's isolation and loneliness is reduced by group creative processes. And we now know in, in the United Kingdom, they now have a whole minister, ministry of loneliness uh, as identified as a political priority. And you know, the irony of course, is we're living in a more connected time with these devices than ever before, and yet we are lonely in a sea of electronic connectivity uh, that has supplanted human connectivity, right? And so, there. Uh, now I often say that, and I have sons who text at very high speed on their phones, it's sort of dizzying to watch their thumbs in action. And I explain that because I'm as old as Jamie Anderson, which is saying something, uh, that in my day, <laughs> in my day, we wrote long letters home uh, to our parents once a week. And this actually uh, enhanced my function as a uh, writer of creative fiction because most of what I told my parents about what I'd been doing while I was away at school was completely made up uh, and that uh, that role that opportunity to take the time to create fiction has been replaced by much more real uh, texting so I I don't think we can use creativity as a tool in the community for fighting a mental illness per se but I think it does do a lot around the suffering associated with loneliness. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for the fantastic talk, really such a pleasure. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, two separate points that you brought up in your talk. One was at the end of your talk uh, that we can't bottle creativity or we haven't found a way to bottle creativity yet. Um, and the other was right at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that creatives often think uh, and then also act in ways outside of the norm. Um, yes. And uh, putting those two points in the context of workplace well-being, which is becoming more and more of a topic, um, even in corporate environments, it's uh, been put on the agenda more and more. Um, do you have um, um, any suggestions um, or any research that shows in what way uh, uh, companies can, or uh, for, uh, uh, managers that are responsible for teams, for example, can support um, creatives thinking outside of the box, or how you can identify that creativity um, and thinking outside of the norm in a positive way and also support it? Right. Yeah. Well, well I, we can look to the past uh, for a really good example of how that was operationalized. The Bell Laboratories in the 1940s and 50s were hotbeds of invention and uh, scientific creativity in the United States. And one of the ways they figured out close to 100 years ago of how to help their employees uh, feel 
useful, valued, and creative in the workplace is they would give them one day a week to pursue ideas of their own design, right? Rather than being handed assignments to do, they had one day a week for uh, them to exercise their own creative processes around what they were interested in. Now the catch was, if they invented something, Bell Labs owned it, right? <laughs> so they weren't stupid. They were very, very smart. And uh, we know from studies of uh, workplace mental health that the most erosive workplaces are high demand, low control. That's the most toxic combination in the workplace. And believe me, I've uh, spent a lot of time lecturing to law firms and architecture firms and banks and other businesses about this important topic of mental health in the workplace because for a simple reason in uh, North America in the post-industrial workplace people are valued for their contributions from the neck up. That's, that's what they contribute to the workplace. Uh, with the exception of lawyers who still carry these l huge briefcases on wheels filled with documents because they don't seem to know about the end of paper. And, uh, but apart from that, they're valued from the neck up. And if you think about the impact of mental illness in that workplace and take an employee and have them experience something common like depression, that erodes their ability to concentrate, to pay attention, to make decisions, to remember things, and to feel motivated, their productivity goes way down. And in, indeed, it is the single biggest driver of lost productivity in those workplaces. And when they invest in mental health in those workplaces and improving the mental health, uh, programs pay for themselves. Right? Short-term disability plummets, right? and people are back to work. It's better for employee uh, retention, for, for recruitment. But still, the barriers of stigma often prevent the kinds of discussions that need to happen in the workplace. So it's a two-pronged response uh, to your question. But you exhibit divergent thinking by being able to tie the first part of my talk to the last part of my talk, <laughs> which is something uh, I can't do. <laughs> I don't even remember the first part of my talk. Hi. Hi. So basically what I wanted to ask you is, I am a senior citizen, so I've seen the years, over the number of years, and I've also worked in a multinational. So my thinking, please uh, agree or disagree with me, is that first all this depression, bipolar, etc., were not so rampant, not so visible. Now with the stress and with the media, etc., and the hype over, you know, competition, designation, it's become a rat race. And there's no end to it. And I personally see that it will multiply. And the psychiatrists will make money and the patients will like be at the receiving end because every other friend or youngster which I know they're all going to counselors in our days where were the counselors our parents were the counselors our friends were the counselors but now suddenly it's the done thing I've gone to a counselor and the counselor is not cheap <laughs> Well, let, let me say, uh, as a, in 40 years of psychiatry, I was never looking for patients. <laughs> I was never recruiting into my practice. Uh, but I appreciate your uh, perspective uh, as, as, a, as a senior citizen. Now, for me, obviously, as a young brunette, uh, <laughs> I, I'm still waiting for that senior citizenship status to befall me. Um, what we know about the rates of mental illness is that they have not actually gone up. They have not gone up. 
rates of acknowledgement and uh, rates of awareness have gone up substantially. And people who previously suffered in silence are now seeking help. And you can be distracted by the sense that it is somehow now fashionable in some way. Uh, trust me, for individuals with mental illness and their families, there's nothing fashionable about it. It is human suffering writ large. And so uh, while you're right, there is a bit of a cottage industry of some counselors and therapists, the worst example being the, the grief counselors uh, who are kind of vultures on pagers waiting for the latest disaster to swoop in. And we have professionalized what used to be healthy community and healthy family responses to the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. When terrible things happen, families have traditionally been the first line of defense. The second line of defense has been the resilience of the human spirit. And the example I often give is the horrendous 9-11 attacks in New York that were very systematically studied, right? And of course, you had your own experience with terrorism here in 2008. But in 9-11, uh, the rates of depression and anxiety shot up in Manhattan in the first week or two. And in the first week, all kinds of grief counselors flew in from around the world to provide support. And they said, we're doing this for free. And it's a terrible disaster. Well, it was free in the first week or two. And, and then they started charging. But the rates of depression and anxiety plummeted down after a couple of weeks to pre-9-11 levels. Right? Because that factor of human resilience to external tragedy is very powerful. Right? Now, there is always going to be a subset of people for whom this is truly devastating. And we see this obviously in war and the development of post-traumatic stress disorder among many soldiers with repeated exposure, not a single episode, but repeated exposure to traumatic events. Uh, so it's a complicated story, but the rates of actual mental illness are not skyrocketing. Okay. I, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned yes. about Okay, I can, I can repeat the question, which is, where does neurodivergence factor in? So we're talking about conditions like autism, spectrum disorder, and other types of neurodivergent conditions. And I would say we are only at the beginning, honestly, of understanding that. And it is a, uh, it's a field, obviously, that has taken on huge interest, right? And because autism as a condition exists on a spectrum, we have some people who are mildly impaired with autism, moderately impaired, or severely impaired, right? And what we used to think of as the British eccentric 100 years ago, probably today would be classified as a mild case of autism spectrum disorder. I showed you the picture of Glenn Gould. Well, there you can find a 700-page treatise on whether Glenn Gould had autism spectrum disorder. And there are some people who've made a fairly convincing argument, people, who, musicians who worked with him, that he did have many of those features, but it did not stop him from becoming one of the most creative performing artists of the 20th century in classical music, but it affected him profoundly in other ways in terms of uh, relationships and, and quality of life. So uh, I, 
And, you know, uh, we, you may have seen those documentaries of some people with autism spectrum disorder who could take a, one look like that at your uh, Victoria Terminus and then take out a piece of paper and draw it in stunning and accurate architectural detail. It's a very impressive feat, but it, it has the unintended consequence of making neurodivergent people who don't have that extraordinary parlor trick skill of feel, oh my God, what, what's wrong with me on top of what's wrong with me, right? So this is why I quoted Kay Jamison as saying, you know, most mentally ill people are not that creative and most creative people are not mentally ill. It's a, it's a Venn diagram. Somebody decide, please. <laughs> uh, we've been talking a lot about mental disorder and creativity. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask a question moving away from that. Sure. Uh, in terms of, is there any research that you could share with us on the impact of music on creativity? To, so to use music to enhance creativity. Uh, now, let, let me say that... Uh, I carry the gene for uh, confidence unrelated to ability, <laughs> right? And it's usually found on the male chromosome. Uh, but I have to acknowledge, and this is rare for me, that I, I really don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> and I'm very mindful this is being recorded. So <laughs> I don't want it to haunt me on the internet. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to the question. <laughs> That's I, yes. Hi. Thank you very much for a lovely talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm particularly want to emphasize something you said uh, in relation to the inhibitory processes that you talked about earlier. Yes. I, my name is Jimmy Modi. I've worked in Bombay for about more than 25 years now as a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, and hypnotherapist. So one of the third early things that I learned was a model of the mind that is widely popular amongst hypnotherapists where it shows that the consciousness of the mind and the unconscious of the, of the mind, there is in between that something that we call the critical consciousness. <clears throat> and the critical consciousness refers to, to that process which you refer to as the inhibitory processes. And it is actually learnt through your lifetime, through uh, all the shoulds and should nots, do's and don'ts that you learn growing up, all the dangers, all the beliefs, good and bad, etc., <clears throat> which are then used with whatever conscious inputs you get to allow you into the unconscious or to not allow you into the unconscious. Okay. And as a hypnotherapist, the basic process of hypnosis is really all about using an external means to work with your consciousness to overpower the critical functions, the inhibitory processes, to weaken them, to jump over them and to go straight into your unconsciousness and to be able to work over there in the unconscious parts of the mind. And with reference to that, I remember once in my early training in psychoanalysis being taken to a place near Panvel, which is outside of Bombay, where there was a great exponent and school of what we call over here Drupad music. And what we found over there and what was actually finally discussed over there was how, how does such a large audience relate to this kind of music? <clears throat> 
and especially to certain sounds that the Drupad music singer can express, which, as he explained to us later, come from the stomach rather than from the chest. Okay? How do, we, how do you relate to those sounds? If you just relate to them consciously, they would make no sense. It's when they reverberate with, your, with something in your unconsciousness that it starts creating some kind of a connection with the singer. And in therefore, in, in, in ans trying to answer the gentleman's question over yes. there about how music affects your creativity, well, if you listen to music and you develop an interest in music, your unconscious mind and your creative uh, filter allows you to open up your unconsciousness more and more to music. And the weaker your creative filter becomes in that context, the stronger your unconscious influences become. And therefore, your talents, whether it's music, painting, sculpture, writing, whatever it is, can actually come out. And people then say, oh, isn't he gifted? But is it really a gift? It's not really a gift. It's something that can be developed in everybody. And that's the tragedy of it. So yes, thank you. I just wanted to make that contribution. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, and I, you know, I'm very mindful of uh, this creative process. I tell people when I, when I would come home from a, a day at the hospital, some people come home from work and they feel they have to have a, a glass of scotch to sort of put the day behind them. And I said, well, you know, I don't do that. I, what I tend to do when I come home from work is sit down at my piano and often in the dark and just play for half an hour or an hour and the rest of the world kind of washes away from me. And it's very uh, engaging and engrossing. Of course, then I found out if I had a glass of scotch while I played the piano, <laughs> I sounded so much better to my ears. <laughs> Thank you.